fun part of my job is to get to hear all of the work that you all are doing on the front lines and get to see the movement growing and learning and really um, uh, happening on the ground. So that is really the thing that gets me up in the morning. I won't um, take a ton of time because unfortunately I have to um, go to another meeting at two. Uh, so I know that we've made some adjustments to the calendar to accommodate and I'm really grateful for that. And uh, so I'll keep my comments short and just say, thank you so much. I'm so excited and can't wait to hear what everyone is up to. Thanks so much, Dr. Burke Harris. Um, so in a moment here, I'm gonna turn things over to our first presenter, um, Tara Millibrand from AAP. Um, and so just, just to let y'all know in terms of format. So what we're gonna do today is hear from um, each of the grantees. And then um, as we did last time, Dr. Burke Harris will ask um, a question or two of the, of the grantee presenters. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, the idea is that we wanna make sure that Dr. Burke Harris has um, the maximum amount of time to interact with all of you directly. Um, and then for the final half an hour of, the, of this webinar, we will open things up for kind of broader discussion among all of us in, um, in the audience. And uh, we'll have some discussion questions that we'll put out there for all of you, but we'll also be very interested in your, your individual questions. So with that, I will turn things over to Tara to start us off. There we go. Hi, I'm Tara Milbrand, uh, project director for the local chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, serving San Diego and Imperial counties. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our chapter is dedicated to achieving physical, mental health, and social well being for all infants, children, and adolescents. And we support our pediatrician members in this endeavor. So while we, our work does support the practice of pediatrics, we're unique from other member organizations and that we also run programs that serve children and families. So we provide local pediatricians with training, education, and ongoing technical support so they can provide their families with high quality care and link them to critical social services. And we have over 500 pediatrician members who advise and direct our work. Next slide. Uh, we are a trusted partner in the community, um, cro uh, convening cross-sector groups to address emerging issues for young children and running countywide programs that support the healthy development um, of children for over 15 years. And all of our programs combined served over 100,000 children last year. Um, so I just wanna give you a little bit of background of our work because it explains how we were really able to jump in and gear up quickly so two of our longstanding programs are Reach Out and Read and Healthy Development Services. Reach Out and Read is a national program. And through our Reach Out and Read San Diego program, we provide training to pediatric providers on early literacy anticipatory guidance, ongoing technical support, and new culturally and developmentally appropriate books for the children they serve. Uh, we have over 100 pediatric medical offices participating in Reach Out and Read throughout the county and participation from all the healthcare groups, um, including federally qualified health centers, Indian Health, the military offices. And so over these last 16 years, um, providing early literacy guidance has become the standard of care in our region. And our chapter is also the countywide coordinator for Healthy Development Services, a program of First Five San Diego. And health, Healthy Development Services is a system of care that screens, assesses, and treats young children with mild to moderate uh, developmental and behavioral concerns who would not otherwise qualify for existing early intervention services. And as a part of this program, we work closely with the pediatric medical offices to ensure that they're educated on the services available to their families and how to make the first and best referral. Um, so over the years, we've provided in-office education on various health topics and convened committee meetings with our pediatricians to address emergent child health issues. And these committees are led by a pediatrician. 
And then at the end of 2019, we were hearing from our pediatricians about their concerns on how to implement the new ACE screener and what they would do if they found something. And um, these were some of the same concerns we'd heard from pediatricians when developmental screening started and before we started the Healthy Development System Service of Care that I mentioned that provides treatment for children with mild to moderate behavioral and developmental concerns. So now pediatricians in our community have really come to depend on these programs and they say that they can't imagine practicing pediatrics without Reach Out and Read and without healthy development services for their families. So to address this new need with ACEs, um, our member pediatrician, Dr. Wendy Pavlovich, stepped up to lead a new ACEs committee. And then we were really excited in two, um, you know, 2020 to get our three new ACEs AWARE grants and really help this become the standard of care in our community. Um, next slide. So for all of our programs and projects, um, we've built on previous proven practices in order to be successful and applied them to our ACEs work. Um, but due to the pandemic, we've had to make quite a few adjustments to make that work. Um, so starting with the supplemental training grant that we've received, this has really given us the opportunity to develop trainings for individual offices to support their efforts in screening, screening and responding to ACEs. And we modeled this training after other trainings we do with our other programs, where we identify a physician champion at the office to champion the project, get everyone on board, and then have a pediatrician present the information to them. And because we had these uh, pre-established relationships with the offices, we were able to easily reach out and offer the ACEs training. Um, but I just want to mention that that process wasn't that easy when we were initially uh, recruiting offices to start Reach Out and Read. And back then, we really had to rely on our member pediatricians to personally reach out to pediatricians and encourage them to participate. So our training model is to invite the front and back office staff to a lunch hour training and incentivize attendance by providing lunch and uh, Reach Out and Read books. Um, that are focused on the topic that we're presenting on. So for ACEs, we're providing social emotional books, such as Mindful Tots and I Like Myself. So when our pediatricians started hearing about our intent to train ACE, on ACEs, uh, they began to reach out to us and we were able to provide the first training in December once we had all our materials approved. Um, and we learned a lot from this first training and then also in speaking to the offices in preparation for the next training. So not all of the things that we have done in the past, um, our strategies working with providers would continue to work during the pand pandemic. And we were constantly learning and shifting. We were finding it was incredibly difficult for providers to attend lunch hour uh, meetings between um, meeting patients at their car, having to change their PPE between patients. They just had little time left for lunch. So by speaking with pediatricians and reviewing the post-training surveys, um, we also found that support staff needed to spend more time on the background and science of ACEs and trauma-informed care, while most of the providers had already done the ACEs Aware core training and wanted to spend more time on scripts, self-care, resources, and referrals, and those types of things. And we also learned that it's best to have participants on their own device so they could actively participate um, instead of having several people viewing a screen with the keyboard not accessible to everyone. And then we were also coming up against timing because more patients were returning to the office and they were becoming busier and having less time for lunch hour trainings. So we've had to adjust and tailor for each of our offices and what they're going for, uh, what they're going through. And so for our um, second training, um, which we just did last week, we worked with a healthcare group with three locations to present the trainings to an all provider meeting in the evening. And we actually had 40 people in attendance at that. And each provider logged in from their own device. And it really helped to have each person on their own device and have more interaction and then also by focusing just on providers, we could spend more time on the issues that were most relevant to them. So now we're working with the physician champion at that healthcare group to do a separate training for support staff at each of the individual offices and spend more time on the points in the presentation where they wanna have more knowledge. 
Uh, next slide. So then um, our second grant is a peer-to-peer -peer grant, and that's really given us the opportunity to develop learning communities amongst our pediatric medical and behavioral health providers through bi-monthly ACES committee meetings and quarterly developmental and behavioral pediatrics meetings. Um, attendees are in various stages of implementing ACE screening, and these meetings have really been invaluable as offices are navigating the process. Discussions have included best practices, lessons learned, scripts, workflow, um, discussions around screening results and how pediatricians can partner with mental health providers to best serve the families, including addressing um, parental ACE history. And we've discussed electronic medical records and coding and smart phrases and all those sorts of things. So um, we've been able to use these meetings also to inform participants on training opportunities and resources on the ACES Aware Initiative, especially connecting pediatricians to resources in their community through our work on the network of care. And then um, after discussion at one of these meetings about pediatricians desire to understand and be able to explain different therapy modalities to families, we applied for a small grant to provide an upcoming training to pediatricians. And we're gonna work with other um, AAP chapters to invite some of them as well. So these meetings also allow us to receive direction and expertise on our work and on how to best support pediatricians. And this grant has allowed us to reach out and really grow the group to all the different healthcare groups in the region, um, as well as the county child health officer who attends um, we're able to provide the county child health officer with additional information and resources to share back with county leadership and managed care plans, um, trying to lay that foundation for a robust ACEs network. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer grant has also allowed us to host bi-monthly office hours, providing technical assistance on implementing and responding to the screening and have more in-depth um, topic conversations on self-care anticipatory guidance. Um, but as I've mentioned, we've had to shift our approach in the pandemic. Um, lunch hours are not well attended. Uh, we're planning the next office hours in the evenings. Um, we know this is a really great resource and we really wanna get it out to everyone. Um, the conversations we have are just wonderful. And then we're also going to make um, post-meeting recordings available and try to advertise them a little bit differently as well. Uh, next slide. So lastly, we're really grateful for our communication grant. Um, this has really allowed us to step up our game by developing materials and content that resonates and engages people like we've never done before. So communication is woven through all three of these grants um, from how we advertise about events and trainings to how we can more fully engage people. Um, we've even had articles about our ACEs work and pediatricians in the community in several major publications. Um, one thing pediatricians have told us is they felt overwhelmed by the different communications they receive on ACEs. So we review all of the emails, newsletters, social media posts to really find the most relevant information and post in our new monthly ACEs at a glance newsletter. And we also pull clips from past events to share since we know everyone's so busy and I'm unable to attend all the great uh, meetings and trainings that are out there. So pediatricians have told us they're very grateful for that newsletter, having everything in one place. And then to better support um, ACEs communication in our region, we meet monthly with the other ACEs Aware grant, uh, communication grantees in San Diego. Uh, we also meet regularly with the other AAP chapters in California who were awarded ACEs Aware grants, sharing best practices and lessons learned. And we've really worked to align our messaging while establishing each of our own target audiences. So our work isn't duplicative. Um, and we've done things like release joint press releases or joint communications, um, collaborating on our messaging, sharing each other's work and participating in each other's activities. And then um, also as part of our communications work, our pediatricians have spoken at different events around our region on ACEs and met with cross-sector leaders to inform them and build the infrastructure. And next slide. And our last work is uh, San Diego State University, the Social Policy Institute received an ACEs Aware Network of Care grant and we partner with them on that. 
and they convene pediatricians and community-based organizations in four different regions in the county to allow them to become more familiar with the local child and family services offered in the community and really build out those relationships. So in the past, we've always provided our pediatricians with information about community resources, but this is really an opportunity for them to get to know the CBOs in their area, to understand their services more fully, and how um, to help really help families to access them. And they've, these convenings have also allowed our pediatricians to work through challenging cases with someone right there to help them direct them to the different services and um, work through issues of bi-directional communication. And then of course, with everything, you know, we then share what we've learned at these committee, at these convenings back at our committees, at our virtual office hours, on our website and our newsletter. Whew. So I've covered a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but I'm really grateful for our pediatricians who are the experts and they're here to answer um, questions. So that is Dr. Pradeep Gidwani and Dr. Wendy Pavlovich. Thanks so much, Tara, what a great presentation. And it was so interesting to see how you how you're, you all are using the different grant types to stack your work and make sure that it's all in, in sync, so really, Really great presentation, thank you. Dr. Burke Harris, I'll turn it over to you. Wow, this is just so impressive. I am so thrilled uh, to be able to hear about and, and see a little snapshot of all of your work. And um, one of the things that I'm really impressed by is that level of collaboration and coordination. What do you think are some of the, the, the factors that helped you all be able to um, to connect and collaborate successfully. So, uh, so I'll jump in. Um, this is Pradeep Kidwani. And um, one of the things that's really happened is we have really established long uh, standing relationships with partners. And one of the key things is whenever we bring folks together, we actually really spend a lot of time preparing for a meeting. So no one's time is wasted. The other piece is um, we really take people's input, we listen to it, and we feed it back. And I think engaging people in the process really helps. And Tara has been fantastic about maintaining relationships with the offices going on over 15 years with Reed John Reed. Her work with Reed John Reed was really pivotal. Um, we've had a consistent executive director, Meredith Kennedy, and they just do such a great job of being consistent in their communication and building relationships. And as an organization, I would call us, uh, or, as an organization, we're relational 360. We, every, in every direction we go, we're always about the relationships and being reliable and neutral and always looking out um, for the mission, which is to help kids and families, which fits so beautifully into the ACEs Aware work and really going upstream. So I think those are some of the pieces that have really had a big impact. Great, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, thanks everyone for your understanding. Um, oh, I'm being told we can do one more question. If anyone, if you have another question you'd like to ask Dr. Burke Harris. Yeah, so as you all um, uh, pivoted and kind of figured out what worked and what didn't work and were course correcting, um, um, how were you getting, what? How are you getting feedback from the providers, and and you know what was the response that you got? So um, we were soliciting feedback actively in the meetings, and then after meetings uh, through direct email communication. Um, one of the reasons we have been so successful with collaborations is again those relationships, and where we were working together with multiple folks that were on the committees, whether it be our ACE committee or developmental peds committee, to kind of hear what's working best, um, and then just immediately changing things. Um, we have pretty warm, open communication. So people in the meeting were like, yep, this is too open. We need some slides to introduce this. We need to then take these clips and share this information in a different way or produce a handout or a product for all of those folks that couldn't make it. And I think then that iterative response has really helped um, gain trust and then have people say, no, you really should go to that meeting. You really should go to that network of care um, lunch because you actually will get 
guidance and help that you need with whatever problem that you're facing. We also include our members in the meetings and the presentations in an interactive way, but also in like a leadership way. We spotlight the different offices um, who are doing ACE implementation because they're all at different phases and actually give them a platform. And that's been truly successful in having people have dialogue in these evening meetings rather than just feeling like we're a didactic uh, presentation. And I just want to add that reviewing that post survey is really helpful um, because you get a lot of information when you're going back through that. And then um, for adjusting how we're advertising, we started looking at, you know, where are our members on most? And we're looking at now Twitter, like so many pediatricians are on Twitter more than they're on Facebook or anything else. So we're going to um, really focus on that for some of our advertising now. Awesome. Really fantastic. I'm so thrilled. Congratulations for your great work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, next, we're going to go to Magdalena Serrano, um, the Behavioral Health Director at Community Health Centers of the Central Coast. Magdalena. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Burke Harris, uh, Lily Clemens, and the Rural Health Team um, for this opportunity. Um, as well as a group of individuals that I have the privilege of serving with at Community Health Centers of the Central Coast. Um, I would especially like to acknowledge um, our grant core team, uh, Jessica Guajardo, Austin Lillenberg, and Sarah Franco, who are also on the screen and will be joining us for the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I am fortunate to work for a very large federally qualified health center um, with 750 other healthcare professionals who truly uh, share the vision of health equity, uh, the desire to serve the most vulnerable and act as a community safety net um, for our, our community and serve um, our mission, which is to enhance the health status of all people in the Central Coast of California with special emphasis on the medically underserved um, and this really aligns with much of the ACES work and really has allowed us to come alongside and really thread, um, I think, both of our visions together um, in our efforts um, with this initiative. Next slide, please. So the CHE uh, ecosystem and patient population is very vast. Um, as you can see from the map, our community health clinic spans two uh, counties, San Luis Obispo, as well as Santa Barbara County. And I would like to just respectfully acknowledge um, that we are in the ancestral lands of the Chumash or Somala people. Um, today, we continue to collaborate with many of our tribal organizations and indigenous communities. And, to, and together through the ACES initiative, um, we are really having the opportunity to honor the past, um, present and future by healing the intergenerational and historical traumas um, that have um, been experienced within our communities. So CHG provides care to approximately 110,000 lives. Um, about 35,000 of those are adolescents, young adults, and children. Uh, we, in and of ourselves, are a 31 clinic integrated network, and we have uh, very robust rural and remote pockets. Um, within our system, we have over 100 treating providers. So these are all different disciplines that come together to really create a patient-centered model of care. Uh, we are, we are um, the service provider for approximately 60% of our Medicaid population. Uh, and we definitely focus on, I would say, our most vulnerable. Uh, we have a strong commitment to serving our migratory seasonal and agricultural workers. Um, this last year, we provided 35,000 uh, encounters to our migrant population. Uh, we also serve our monolingual Spanish speaking and, and mixed text speakers. We have a very large indigenous enclave within Santa Maria. And we, we also uh, place special emphasis on addressing the needs of our limited English proficiency individuals and ensuring that they are properly navigated throughout our healthcare system. So next slide. So CHG has a very robust behavioral health staffing model, and I would really like to note the citation that this model is based off the University of Washington Ames model. So the model of collaborative care that we utilize was really informed by their best practices and that evidence-based science that um, really was the foundation of what we developed. 
Um, as you can see and looking at the slide, uh, we really try to start where our patients are in the community. Uh, our model is comprised of a behavioral outreach team of promotoras, outreach workers that sometimes literally begin their interactions with our community members in the field. Um, they link back to our brick and mortar clinics and also we do provide a remote service line. So we have a behavioral health integration care coordination system that really is part of that collaborative model. When patients need additional levels of care, we also have a very large uh, behavioral health counseling system of 15 social workers um, who speak the three threshold languages in our service area, which is English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We provide uh, psychiatry as well as telepsychiatry services and offer um, those services through six psychiatrists who are strategically placed throughout our three regions. Um, they work in tandem with our primary care providers and we have a shared care plan under a one uh, system registry that really is at the heart of ensuring that collaborative care. Um, Patients are then returned essentially to their natural resources in hopes of completing that circle and enabling them um, to then provide and navigate other community members. Next slide, please. So our ACE is Aware partnership. Um, so over the last seven months, our team has really led an initiative of provider engagement as well as peer-to-peer -peer learning activities um, towards the goal of not just increasing ACEs, but also increasing our provider training, attestation, improving our support staff and providers, um, just really knowledge for them to understand the significance of addressing ACEs and toxic stress, um, really equipping our providers with options for evidence-based interventions and developing a trauma-informed and truly trauma-responsive culture. We didn't want people to just scream. We wanted them to know what they needed to do once they screened and feel comfortable and confident um, in their personal skills. So next slide. So navigating the changing landscape of care. So I really appreciated, um, you know, the previous presenters comments around the fact that we sort of had to pause and really look at what was happening um, within the last year within the healthcare landscape. Um, so we paused, we really had to honor the moment and frankly, the parallel process uh, to ensure that we had equip providers and staff with knowledge of the community and agency resources, develop a really, a really concrete warm handoff referral process, um, which included formal policies and procedures, really provided evidence-based interventions to increase not just the screening, but the confidence when screening did occur, um, and also a care pathway for patients with high ACE score. So um, initially, one of the things that we had to address was our staff expressed concerns that screening for ACEs would result in a high volume of protective service cases um, while having limited interventions or response. And we had to do this in the context of the fact that some of our clinicians had pivoted and were remote and weren't readily available to our providers who were used to having them down the hallway. Um, in addition, we had to really address the fact that this was a very vulnerable and intimate time for everyone. Suddenly there was a parallel process that was taking place in which we not only had to respond to the needs of our patients in our community, but we found that within our own team, staff members were coming forward. It was as we were, as we were providing this understanding of ACES and developing a knowledge base, people were taking a moment, really have some, having some inflection and really realizing some of these things are occurring in my own family. Some of these things are occurring in my own home and this was bringing this forward. Um, so that really was an element that we had to um, take note of and ensure that our, our staff and our team were equipped um, with the skills and the resources to not just navigate the patient's journey, but also bring forward the best and healthiest version of themselves. So next slide. So, um, in order to really uh, create an additional uh, foundation and knowledge, we partnered with the Trauma Resource Institute. Um, I, like many people in our community, are fortunate to um, have been introduced to the PRIM model approximately seven years ago. And this was a natural fit because this is actually a model that is both informed as well as teaches the science of ACEs. So for us, we felt that this would help us to educate our staff and providers and really, really help us to build a much more robust training network. Um, 
So this allowed us to provide some really practical and rapid self-regulation and self-management skills for our team. Um, we really enjoyed the fact that this could be adapted to both the telephonic and telehealth uh, platforms, which we were also utilizing. Um, and then the thing that I think was really critical was that this is a model that we could use with ages from three to 75. Um, it had been adapted in multiple languages, had been used internationally, was really well vetted, um, adapted to lots of cultures. And because we did work with some folks who um, uh, spoke indigenous languages that were not written, this also is a model that can be used with infographics. And so these are really critical elements for us to look at when um, providing some of these foundational um, skills. Next slide. So first and foremost was our provider engagement activities. So um, because we have such a large um, a population that we serve, we really targeted our activities to serve our, or on our providers who are serving our Medicaid populations within the behavioral health department. Um, so we focused on developing really trauma-informed evidence-based and those culturally responsive skills um, went back beyond just the initial, the initial ACEs trainings and broke those down into some of, I think, the core nuggets that are really highlighted within the ACEs webinar, really exploring implicit bias, ensuring that people understood what part of the conversations um, that they needed to hone in on and really understand about the various patients that were coming into their offices, understanding the importance of CRIM skills like grounding resources and help now so that they can mitigate their own energy or concerns when working with patients. Um, we're really proud of the fact that all 15 of our clinical social workers are trained and attested um, in um, our ACEs. Um, we also strategically involved our medical administration and our chief medical officer, um, who himself is um, a neonatologist, as well as our medical director who practices family medicine, were also trained and attested. It was really important that this didn't just live within the behavioral health department, that this was something that everyone adopted, that everyone realized it was part of a much larger initiative and ultimately part of moving us towards a culture that, that was really trauma-informed as we prepared for our response as an organization uh, to the pandemic and moving into 2021. Next slide, please. So um, within our peer-to-peer -peer learning activities, we had the opportunity to thread, I would say thread or connect both our provider as well as our support staff's um, uh, training process. So one of the things that uh, quickly became very um, uh, evident is that much of the algorithm as Dr. Burke Harris put forward you know, over a year ago lies in the hands of RMAs. Um, but our initial thought was, let's focus on our social workers, let's focus on our clinicians, let's focus on our providers. And we had to, again, pause, uh, pivot, and realize, no, we really need to focus on our navigators, our peer-to-peer -peer care coordinators, and ensure that our medical assistants were front-loaded with resiliency skills so that they could also utilize them and teach the patients the same skills. So we really borrowed from that peer-to-peer -peer model that so many of us have used in behavioral health and also in recovery. Um, and we found that this is really where we start to get the buy-in and the cultural shifts because these were that first contact point for so many of our patients. These were the folks that were used to doing the screenings, those PHQs, those GAD sevens, and we wanted the ACEs to be part of that standard of care. So this is really where we started to bridge that. Next slide, please. So in doing so, what we have started to see as the initial phase of some of the impacts that I think we are really celebrating um, is she, she has really integrated both a digital as well as an in-person ACE and Pearl screening um, platform. Um, this is completely integrated into our electronic health record system. We're very thankful that uh, approximately 30 days ago, Athena Health has created a live scorable uh, Pearl and as well as ACES um, screening instrument into the EHR system. It's now in English and in Spanish. So these are much more readily available and accessibility is critical when you're working with that 15 minute uh, patient appointment in primary care or what we anticipate to be an influx of new pediatric patients getting ready to go back to school. Uh, we have also been able to enhance our growing network of care with partnering organizations to collaborate, to really collaborate in mitigating toxic stress. 
uh, this really created accountability for us that otherwise may have not occurred. So the three things that we were really wanting everyone to feel confident in is that we had a cross-sector collaboration and partner to address situations that would necessitate um, you know, a report, whether it be addressing domestic violence, intimate partner violence, child abuse. Um, we wanted them to know that we had someone that was part of our care pathway. Um, and then I think the thing that I personally celebrate the most is that the culture of our clinic system is really sh is shifting. Um, you can start to hear that language. The trauma-informed nomenclature is part of what we're talking about. Um, we don't always have to identify what um, TIC stands for or ACEs. This is part of not just the behavioral health scope, um, but it's really starting to be part of everyone's um, language, everyone's culture, how we think about um, how we serve our patients. Next slide. Lessons learned uh, very humbly thus far. Um, really to consider all perspectives. Our patients' perspectives must be really critical and in, in realizing that there's a lot happening for everyone right now and, and to ensure that our pace and our process reflects their experience. Um, the support staff, as they are such a critical element to the care team, um, our providers, um, and to ensure that they're given these skills as they onboard, as well as re-recruited and that they are able to retain these skills. Medical administration, because you constantly need those executive champions um, to bring this as you know, part of the priorities for your organization because there's so many competing agendas at this time. Um, being mindful of both the messaging as well as the messenger. Um, continuing to know the why that is relevant for each stakeholder. If each stakeholder doesn't know the why, they're going to presume that this lives in behavioral health or the pediatric clinics. Um, developing that cross-sector system of care. So when those situations arise in clinic that do create that energy or um, create um, concern that you have partners that are available um, in real time to respond and support the team. And, and creating adaptable, adaptable workflows to sustain um, your care team. And one of the biggest things that we had to adapt was a social worker of the day to ensure if there was a case that was happening on a remote platform in clinic, that there was someone who could help support the in-clinic team when those screenings came forward that really needed an immediate attention. And um, that's where we have landed. Um, we anticipate much more to learn and, uh, and we continue to kind of walk the walk with all of you. And we simply appreciate this opportunity to come alongside all of you um, and learn and partner. And we hope that we continue to have um, these opportunities to share in, as we continue this work in 2021. So thank you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Um, I have about five questions, but I'll wait till later. So Dr. Burke Harris, how would, would, would go ahead and jump in? Oh, I have to say, I would love to say that I have a question and I'm sure there are lots of questions floating around in my mind, but I just, I feel like I'm getting the cumulative effect of these two presentations and it's literally just blowing me away. Um, I think that though, I mean, I even notice the way that you mentioned that the culture of the clinic system is shifting and the language is shifting. I feel like even, even in having the opportunity to do these grantee spotlights and see how our, the, how our grantees, like the, the, the language and as you all are learning more how that is being cemented into what you're doing. And I can just see the way that even that, that you know, the language and the presentation, all of that is, um, is shifting as well. I just, um, this just makes me so happy. I just, I just have to say like, I'm, I'm just so thrilled and proud and grateful of the work that you're doing. And I think that the theme that's, that is coming, coming through to me so strongly is adaptation, right? As we are all figuring out how to do this and do it in the context of COVID and trying to pilot and figuring, okay, that didn't work, but we just, you know, we shift and we do something else and see the ways in which people are learning forward and um, even the peer-to-peer -peer for the MAs that just jumped out at me 
in terms of something that, um, how important that is and how important uh, front loading resiliency. I love that among the, 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 the front uh, staff, right? Like um, the on the ground staff. That, that it's just all so powerful. Um, so I think the only thing that I have to say is thank you. I'd love to have a coherent question to ask, but I'm just blown away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Not yeah. very often that you're speaking, Dr. Burkett. Sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. My one question. My one question that I have is, so this, this is, this is real. I, this is, may not be the question I'm supposed to ask, but I just have to ask this. Like, how are you? Like, how are you doing? How is this? feeling to you? Um, it was a real answer. It, it feels like a lot, but I'm a social worker. So we've been talking about trauma and resiliency for the last 20 years. I remember when I first saw, um, I first saw the resiliency model and as a woman, as a woman of color, the fact that somebody was talking about resilience and the protective factors and something that mimicked my life experience um, for me was so empowering. And so I would say that um, I'm thrilled to have everyone join the conversation. And I feel incredibly humbled and privileged to have a team of 52 people in behavioral health that, that embody resiliency every day. And I, as much as I might be really tired and feel that I have a very um, complete platter. Um, I also feel that I don't lift that alone. And I have those three individuals in that camera there, as well as 49 other people that walk with me and come alongside me every single day. So um, resilient, empowered, um, and so inspired and motivated um, that we are on the front lines and that we have programs like ACES that are gonna support us in 2021 when every family, but every child is gonna really need us the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Um, really great presentation. Um, gosh, yeah, this is, this is amazing. So uh, without further ado, Beverly Kyer, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts and presentation next. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. I am very honored to be here with you sharing this. Before I speak, I do wanna acknowledge my team, um, Sarah Newton and Megan McQuaid. These are my right-hand people and all that I do, I do. I'm able to do because of them. So they're here and I just wanted to shout out to them. Uh, we are the Kaya Group and uh, our mission is to help the helpers. These are all of the frontline people, the human service providers who work intently with people who are impacted by traumatic life experiences. And those are agencies of human services. That includes the children, the youth, the adults, and the seniors. They do the work and we provide the help for them. When I started my company in 2004, it was about largely about the impact of uh, trauma on childhood brain development, behavior, and learning. I did note when I'm uh, training these uh, providers that we struggle a lot with the challenging behaviors of the children without understanding what undergirds or what motivates them. We also were looking at some health factors on a very, very small scale, but still not understanding what the causations are. So boy, was I missing the data, I'm missing the evidence, which I realized when I looked at ACES, nor was I even close to the full implications of the health risks of unbuffered abuse and neglect uh, and uh, uh, dysfunctional households for children. It had also been my primary mission, primary mission during the same 17 year period to train and support human service providers uh, to help them understand and mitigate the effects of their own secondary and vicarious trauma, their post-traumatic stress syndrome and burnout combined known as compassion fatigue. That's my work, compassion fatigue. My role is to help them learn how to quickly restore and maintain sustainability and resilience in their overall wellness while they are on the front lines of traumatic life experiences and especially now during this pandemic. Next slide. And so my curriculum is called Surviving Compassion Fatigue Through the ACES Aware Lens. 
when we went into this project, we were thinking that we are creating a partnership, a friendship between the curriculum for compassion fatigue and the ACEs research to meet the needs of the, the goals uh, of this particular project. And as we did the integrative work of combining these uh, uh, two subjects together, uh, uh, we realized that this was more like a marriage, that ACEs aware and compassion fatigue seemed so perfectly suited for each other. And now even as we dig deeper into it, uh, we're clear that it's more like a DNA they cannot be separated. When working with providers, I cannot forget to help them see their work as battling with the risk factors created by the adverse childhood events, but also that the providers working with these children and, and, and youth uh, are exposed to uh, adverse events in their work. And some of them even have their own childhood experiences that they're combated with. And they need to be aware of how to protect themselves while they do the work so that they can continue to do the amaz amazing services that they do. Uh, the participants uh, in the classrooms prior and now, uh, they receive multiple strategies and techniques and methods for recovery uh, to reduce and prevent the negative effects of compassion fatigue uh, by restoring their central nervous systems, uh, regaining some peace, some inner regulation. And regulation is a key word for me. All of the sessions that we do are highly interactive and it, they're experiential too because I allow them to have opportunities to feel a difference in their central nervous systems, their calm, their, their mood, their breathing regulation, even their heart rate. Uh, we're allowing it all to the managerial groups, the staff, the direct care staff, uh, uh, the ancillary staff, but they get to make the connection of these traumatic experiences, impacts on them, both in their professional and their personal lives. Next slide, please. I am, um, as we make the transition between the ACEs portion of the sessions, uh, moving into the compassion fatigue, we use a number of illustrations to kind of help anchor the learning, but for people to connect, they, they, they can see some relatedness. And so I, I use a little bit of humor too, but I like these illustrations. And one of the metaphors I really, really like is was designed by a dear friend of mine named Trudy Frizzell. And she designed this uh, metaphor about the scuba diver, which I relate very much to people in the helping services. As you know, the scuba diver uses oxygen tanks to help them survive in the sea. They actually and very carefully check the equipment before they go down into the sea. They consistently monitor the remaining oxygen levels and take action to get themselves to safety, making sure that they have enough to get back to the surface so that they can survive. Uh, it is crucial. Also, key to them. They never ever go down alone. They always go down with a buddy. And I have a big, big issue while we're doing this work on the front lines, we should all have accountability partners. Now daily, we send human service providers into their service, highly exposed to secondary and vicarious trauma and burnout and post-traumatic stress disorder. But without the preparation that they need, uh, to understand what's going to happen, what are the risk factors, to be so aware of what's happening inside of themselves so that they can take this kind of action. Therefore, they are at higher risk for toxic stress syndrome. Uh, I add too, I keep adding this, uh, the cumulative effect of the COVID-19 and also the racial climate in the country now, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are factors that create this compounded a cumulative and exacerbated effect in the worker. My mission says that they are to be informed, they are to be knowledgeable about compassion fatigue and aware of the neurophysiological impacts on them like the cognitive ones, the behavioral, the interpersonal, the spiritual, the emotional and the physical impacts on them to be prepared for that so that they can gain tools, which I also teach, to buffer and mitigate and prevent the worst possible health conditions that could happen for them, as well as what happens to the children. Uh, we use 
I, part of that metaphor to me is says you're looking at the release. I, I have these three things that I like to talk about: release, reboot, recharge. Release, reboot, recharge, which I encourage the people in the field to use on a daily, daily basis. But this will connect with this metaphor that they have to check their own tanks. They are to make sure that they are gauging where they are in each moment. They are to reboot themselves uh, uh, to to be careful that there's enough, or maybe it's just time to stop and pause and take a break. And they are to recharge by refilling themselves each and every day. Another scuba diver analogy that I really, really like is the importance of the accountability partner. Even I had a number of situations and one in particular where an audience participant in one of our ACES sessions, she reflected that she really comes up for air doing the work you know, with the COVID situation, people, this is kind of a blurring of a day. There's no particular start, there's no particular end. Everything is merged together. The children, the family in the house, all of that stuff going on that's affecting the, the work and the personal life as well. But she doesn't come up and that's what happens over time. And many of the participants in these sessions acknowledge this too, that they just reach a point that there's nothing left. Some mornings they just get out of bed with this, what they like to call the term uh, emotional exhaustion and it can't barely face today. So I love this metaphor that makes that connection between uh, the ACEs and the compassion fatigue. Next slide, please. So these are some of the sessions that we do, which has really, really evolved from just providing a training about a particular subject. These sessions and gatherings, as I often call them, are formatted based on how uh, I customize uh, the sessions for each of the various kind of clients. I work with every kind of uh, 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 professional um, association, from law to education to mental health, medical health, the social workers and medical doctors, the human trafficking, the immigration folks, with the whole scope. But I talk to them. Tara, Sarah talks to them too to find out what they need and how we need to customize these trainings to include them. And one of the things that has happened, the ACES component, I, I honor it and hold it just as uh, uh, I decided uh, along with my uh, liaison team from ACES Aware. Yet I make some adjustments in how we present the compassion fatigue because people want a number of things uh, based on how stressed, how traumatized their people are, how fragile they are uh, in the course of their work. Uh, some people want a full day, some people want to part one, part one and part two uh, kind of day. Uh, they like the support. A lot of people are asking for the support sharing circles where staff and providers have an opportunity to kind of gather around and we have like a talking circle where they can kind of process and express together what is going on and support each other. Uh, there's some people who want guided kind of decompression sessions. These are people who really, really face some intensely uh, tragic situations more often. I get a lot of requests a lot of requests for these 30 minute sessions, which are right at the beginning of the workday for a number of the organizations, that they just want 30 minutes to kind of release and reboot and then we use some maybe some kind of mindfulness technique, definitely a breath technique and some visualizations to kind of help them get back on their feet and face today. Uh, so there's any number of things that are provided, but it is at their request and it meets their need and the feedback has been Pretty extraordinary. Next slide, please. Today, we have provided sessions on surviving compassion fatigue uh, through the lens of ACES uh, to these groups, uh, which include the court appointed special advocates, uh, which they're all the, the entire coast of California, Alameda Public Health, uh, EBAC, and the California state foster parent association actually for them and this was really really exciting it was really a stretch we did the conference you may know that they have an annual conference somewhere in the state every year and because of the COVID, they had no idea what they were going to do they were actually going to do nothing nothing about it just kind of let that go and hope for the best when COVID was over and so uh sarah and i had a conversation with the uh 
uh, one of the coordinator of the programming for this big, big conference. It's tons of speakers, tons of this. We did the whole conference and we designed it with a, the way they wanted to. And the feedback, the feedback, I can't say enough. These were foster parents. They were case managers. They were social workers. They were the kinship uh, parents. These are a number of people who work in at the as caregivers uh, the stakeholders in the lives of children. And a part of what was encouraged, uh, Sarah, Sarah had put together a wonderful package that all of our participants get uh, for people who are familiar about ACEs or have some familiarity about it, or people who is completely new to them and people who may be interested in actually taking the ACEs course so that they can uh, be trained to do the actual screenings. but. There was a mixture of that in the audience, and so they had that uh, that information uh, neatly packaged and distributed to them. But all of them, no matter what their role was, they understood coming out of that, and this was a feedback that we got, that everybody plays a role in promoting and encouraging the importance of the ACEs screening, and that really, really was a success in my mind. Uh, we have all also partnered, and this is exciting too, we were able to partner with two of our fellow uh, ACES grantees. That was the EBAC program, that's East Space Agencies of Children and uh, First Five Alameda. Next slide. I am, um, people ask me, how do you feel? Or what indicates to you that you're successful in work? And just like the previous speaker said, it's the feedback we get from folks however it comes very often. At the end of almost every session, I think maybe every session, Sarah could attest to that, I always ask people what are takeaways uh, from the time we spent today. And so I'm already getting some feedback. And then uh, we get some additional notes from folks in the chat box. I gotta make it very interactive so people could talk to us the whole time through the chat box. But uh, I got this, these notes from two of the directors who are also present at these trainings that I just wanted to share with you. Uh, and, and incidentally, the very first one, she wasn't sure what her people would do if they would show up and if they would respond at all because it was so depleted, so worn out, so frustrated, so hands up hanging on by a thread. And she says they showed up and really opened up. That surprised her. She was present. They needed to talk and the introduction and warmly bringing them to talk about their personal wellness needs was great. The information on ACEs awareness and toxic stress management portion was excellent. Lastly, closing with some guided meditation was especially nice and a relaxing gift. That's from a director and she intended to she continues to send more notes and uh, requesting that there's more work for some additional staff. These people are being deployed to face some very, very difficult challenges out there because of the COVID. Another director from CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, and she has teams all up and down the coast. She wanted work, the ACES work for her leadership team, for her direct services team and for her volunteer team. She says, these are powerful gatherings and will make such a difference in our CASA community. These people work so closely aligned with children and they found it absolutely pivotal for them to be able to understand what's going on with the children. And again, take the responsibility to say, so we could promote and we could encourage uh, the ACEs screening and the testing. So I'm always excited to see evaluations, the feedback and the follow-up from people who attended. Uh, they do express their appreciation for the benefit of being able to have ACEs. They also did this express that it was affordable for them. They didn't have to dig down. That was what allowed many of them, actually allowed many of people to be able to even do something because again, because of the COVID experience, a lot of people weren't going to be doing training, hoping that this thing would be over in a matter of months. Uh, they were grateful about the impact they experienced in the highly interactive and experiential uh, session or gatherings that we had. Regarding the impact. Beverly, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I know Dr. Burke Harris does have to go um, to a critical meeting with her other full-time job <laughs> related to the vaccine distribution. Um, Dr. Burke Harris, did you, did you have another minute or would you like to ask a question before you have to leave? Let's take one more minute. Okay, okay. sorry, go ahead. 
So regarding the impact, the California is privileged to have ACE as aware. Hopefully we can take it nationally. I do talk to people nationally and it's right on the tip of my tongue that it needs to be there. The impact on me has been a revelation of making the connection between the children's ACEs and the providers uh, trauma and even my own. Thus ACEs aware is married to my compassion fatigue forever. It's an extraordinary connection. Next slide. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to read this slide, but if I may, in honor of your time, Dr. Burke, is first of all, say how much I appreciate uh, being able to do this, that the grant allowed me to reach so many people in the field of services. And I'm grateful to everybody who supported this, my liaison people and all the coordinators. But if I may respectfully have a call to action uh, saying this, that if we do not immediately and continually address the neurophysiological needs of human service providers, especially our nurses and doctors, we risk a disastrous decline in the same care providers available to help uh, the overwhelming need of people and children in particular. Uh, my role is to help them learn how to quickly restore and regain uh, sustainability and resilience, overall wellness while on the front lines <coughs> of traumatic life experiences. So, ACES Aware is an investment, <coughs> excuse me, in the education of service providers, targeting the wellness of children and uh, screening treatment enables good wellness. But to actualize this, we have an opportunity to recognize that we are in this together and that we see the opportunity to partner together to continue this work. And uh, that's what I wanted to say. And thank you for the time to be able to say it. Well, Beverly, thank you and your team for your wonderful work. I have to say, uh, when you made the analogy of moving from an integration to a marriage to uh, DNA, oh, you got me right there. Everybody knows that I love the science. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Um, I, I um, Given that I'm um, overdue for my next meeting, I, I'll make my question to you very simple, which is that I think um, there was a conversation in the chat Probably most people on this call would like to shamelessly steal or borrow or appropriately attribute your scuba analogy, um, including myself. So sure. if that's okay, is that okay with you? I got permission from Trudy Frizzell, who is a friend of mine, and I will be sure to ask her to let me give it, as long as you give her credit, but let me oh, just sure. promise to get back to you on that. Yes, if, so we'll ask the ACEs Aware team to send out the appropriate attribution uh, for all of us because it just felt right on. Target. It's so much better than the air thing coming down from the plane because that's after the, the scuba diver is preventative. It's that's aware. Right. That's right. Love everything about it. Just love everything about it. And I know that there are likely many grantees on this call who, uh, would love to have your training and your your resources available as well. So, um, and partner, we will. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. This has been honestly the best part of my day, the best part of my week, the best part of my month. This is the thing that just fills me up is hearing from all of you, hearing the amazing work. Uh, that you are doing and recognizing the ways that it, in which we are. We're not, we're changing practices, uh, but we're changing culture. We're changing, uh, we're changing ourselves. We're changing our institutions. We're changing our community. And it just feels so powerful. Uh, so I'm really, really grateful for all of you and just keep up the, the amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Burke Harris. It's great to have you with us as always. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Um, great. We will we will open the floor up for some more questions and discussion at this point. Um, Jennifer and Lily, do you want to give some guidelines for folks about how they can get their questions asked and answered? Yeah, if folks want to either type in a question in the chat um, for any panelists um, or feel free to click your raise your hand icon um, and we can unmute you. <coughs> great. 
And while you're doing that, um, I will just toss out a couple of moderator questions just to get the conversation going. Um, so if I can go back to Magdalena, can you talk a little bit about um, how telehealth has been working for you? I was really impressed and interested to see um, that you all have figured out a way to utilize the EHR technology to, um, to try to screen over telehealth. And I'd just love to kind of hear how that's been going or um, any you know, sort of challenges and, and mid-course corrections you might've made through that process. Sure. Um, so uh, with telehealth, we have had the opportunity uh, to um, really work with patients in multiple languages. Um, screening can be really intimate at times. And so the one benefit from telehealth is it's allowed us to uh, use interpreters um, and provide services that otherwise we would not have been able to provide. The second thing that I think is uh, was unexpected is that on some of the questions that are a little more, um, a little more, uh, energy evoking that are a little more difficult to under, to answer, the um, opportunity to not have to have that conversation face to face has really benefited some of our patients, which was a really unexpected element of, of doing the telehealth visit. Um, and we found that especially true um, when working with maybe a provider that was, you know, just establishing clinical rapport with a patient or a provider who maybe um, was the same age as the patient, things that sometimes can create um, some discomfort. So um, I think that was one of the elements of, of telehealth that really um, supported our initiative. I don't know if anyone else from the team has thoughts on that. Um, Jessica, Sarah, um, Austin. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to really quickly also make one additional point that um, I think the, the telehealth platform has also contributed to a decrease in no-show rates. Um, and in particular, we have um, a program called My Colorful Life that works with LGBTQ youth. And we've seen um, tremendous engagement on the telehealth platform uh, that we had to transition to and seeing um, more engagement as uh, more of our patients are able to have that connection regardless of geographical location. Um, either of you have? Yeah, and I think it's important to note that we had started telehealth prior to COVID. So um, our psychiatry team was already actively using telehealth platforms. And so some of our patients were already used to that platform. So when COVID hit, we really were in a good position to pivot and really move our social workers into that role as well. Um, and we were actually pleasantly surprised with how well our patients responded. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of challenges when it comes to like, you know, the digital divide and making sure that we're able to, you know, link and reach out to all of our patients. Um, also, just not having that like, that sense that you can get when you're in the same room with someone, um, not being able to necessarily see their see their face or their reactions. And so there's definitely some challenges, but we have found that our patients really have responded well and have opened up uh, really well over the telehealth platforms. That is really great to hear. That's definitely one of the, perhaps, I don't know if it's really a myth, but that, that, that uh, you know, people have stopped screening, obviously, when they can't be in person together with patients. So um, that's great to hear that you found a, a strategy that's working. Um, so in terms of a next question, feel free again to put questions in the chat or to raise your hand, the little raise your hand button um, from the bottom here. Uh, but I'll turn to the folks at AAP Chapter 3 and Tara. Um, Tara, tell us a little bit about um, the work that you do in terms of partnering across um, other organizations in your community. Sure. Um, so each of our different projects, I would say, have different partners that we've worked with. Um, so with Healthy Development Services, um, there are different social service agencies that we have worked with as the leads for um, that provide the direct service. Um, so we've had the opportunity to um, engage with them and partner with them. Then with Reach Out and Read, we've really connected with the um, early literacy agencies in our area. So we've worked with the library and um, and with the um, San Diego Council on Literacy and 
you know, and I think back over the years, it's really um, being interested in each other. I don't know how else to put it, you know, that it's like we're attending their meetings and hearing about the work that they're doing. And they're also coming to our meetings. Um, and so it's just the building of those relationships over time and um, being able to continually go back to those partners when things come up, when we're working on different things, um, just to have had that relationship established over the years has been really critical to our work. That's great. Um, Beverly, can I ask you to just share a little bit about your thoughts for this next phase? Talk to us about kind of how you're thinking about continuing to build um, your project outreach plans going forward. Oh, well, we'll have some things in place. Uh, obviously with the continuation of COVID that it is keeping us pivoting on how we're gonna reach. There's a lot of people in uh, various rural areas that have little opportunity, have people have all kinds of levels of technology or not there for. And so I'm in the process of making, recording videos of some of my mindfulness visualization things to have that stuff available. I am currently doing a weekly broadcast live to talk about various aspects of compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, vicarious, all the anxiety, the depression, living at home with the kids, all of those subjects are there. There's about 27, excuse me, about 26 episodes available. And Sarah has that contact information. That's just free. That's available. And I've encouraged people to distribute that uh, with it. Uh, you don't know this. I my, my liaison person knows, but I had another cardiac episode. And I really talked on one of those videos on how I even let that slip up on me as much as I know about compassion fatigue, how we could suppress various aspects of the stress that we face on a day-to-day -day basis moving too fast and I miss something. So the videos are very, there's something there for everybody, even parenting in the age of COVID. Um, so those things are coming down the road. I am in the process also of building an online campus. I think online work is here to stay. So that's already in action. And the all of the courses related to uh, trauma for the children, for the adults, for the workers, for frontline workers, recovery, first responders. But I also want, and I'm sharing this with you because I just gave a call to action to partner with you more, that those of you with your own expertise uh, get to be uh, faculty on that campus as, as you wish, because I want a lot of stuff available for service providers all over this country. And I can't get to all over the country, none of us can. so. Those are some of the strategies that uh, are in place. They're they're being worked out as we speak. And, Indeed. Uh, yeah. oh, sorry. I have a question, though. May I ask a question of uh, the previous two speakers? I think that was Tara Magdalena, and even Dr. Uh, Gidwani, if you will. Uh, among the people that I've met recently, and we're in the process of talking about how I could bring the ACEs to them, was a group of doctors at a particular hospital, and their concern was that for them to do the ACEs screening and have um, a disclosure of uh, abuses, are they in the, they're afraid they'd be in the position of having being uh, reporters, which, and so they need, um, and I may not be the best person to have that conversation with them. It might be one of you um, uh, in the doctor's role, but I, I, I need, what, what do you say? What, what is the role? Is there a way for them to, um, um, uh, suggest the screening as the screening without them putting themselves in that predicament. You know, actually, I would love for my colleague, Wendy Pavlovich, to speak to this. She's in practice and is a pediatrician and actually deals with this on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Wendy Pavlovich. I'm a general pediatrician at a large family uh, health center, FQHC. And this is a legitimate concern um, that I feel often and I feel. So what we know from people who have been screening for years is very rarely does screening tell you a reportable offense that hasn't already actually been reported and dealt with in other ways. That only if you have a screening form that is 10 out of 10 on the Pearl's front page, would you know that you absolutely have a reportable um, issue that you need to deal with. And that part of being trauma-informed is we're always giving patients the power to disclose or not disclose. So we're using de-identified. Some people are using identified, but remember the patient's filling that out. 
So setting it up correctly for the patient and the staff, that this is voluntary. You tell us what you wanna know, and we want us to know we are here to protect you. There may be some times where I actually have to get help to protect you because that's my job, but it's the right thing to do uh, for you. And but you get to choose. Um, the data that's been coming out of actually Dr. Nate Beanhurts Harris's group and um, looking at uh, Dana Long's group where they're really trying to collect numbers on all of this is that this is a really very, very tiny impact and that every provider who has discovered something that hasn't been reported before and needs to be reported is feeling grateful, thankful, blessed to have that information because it's the right thing to do. Um, so that's what I walk through uh, with providers that raise that as a concern. Um, and usually once people start screening, and this is what we've heard from all of our different clinical partners that are at different phases of this, is that once you start doing it, most of those fears actually subside because you are rewarded by the appreciation and the conversation that comes from screening. Thank you. That's very helpful, doctor. Additionally, what I would add to that is two, two pieces, is it's really important to work with your local um, county government to have someone come out and actually do the trainings for mandatory reporting, just to, to go back. We went through those processes with a couple of clinics early on. Um, you wanna have those in place. But the other part is, is in my work with Healthy Families America Home Visiting Program, who are also mandatory reporters, the approach of really being collaborative, as you heard Dr. Pavlovich talk about, of collaborative and problem solving with the family and of talking about the safety of the child and the parent and helping the parent. Because again, we don't want the child broken up for your family, but we want the child safe. And so you can often get parents to really come on board with that collaborative, non judgmental, supportive place. And, you know, knowing that the parent had challenges in their own childhood that are coming to bear now, um, how do we help both? And how do we take a two generational approach and really lead with our hearts with safety as, a, as the forefront? Thank you very much. It's very helpful, both of you, appreciate it. And, and just to, to add to that, and, and thank you all of you for, for your really eloquent descriptions of, of this issue. And, and I, I, it's so compelling to hear you say it's the right thing to do, right? And it's, it's so hard to figure out when and how to make that distinction. So thank you for that. Um, we have been Dr. Burke Harris and um, Director Johnson of DSS at the state level have been in some conversations. So, you know, I can't promise timing or anything like that, but just know that um, people are working to try to clarify this issue in, in a way that's helpful um, to all of your work. Anyone else have a question they want to ask of our panelists? I'll keep going if not. Okay. Um, Magdalena, um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, so this actually is a good segue, um, just if you talked a lot about culture change and how you kind of um, educated everyone in your entire organization about the importance of screening and how it can be helpful. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that and, you know, sort of how you, how you feel like you approached creating that meaningful understanding of the importance of screening? I'm sure. I think um, the one thing that I really want to highlight in the most humble manner is this beautiful model that we created that was shown that took five years to create um, and lots of time and dedication and really challenging conversations. Um, and that really is the platform and the foundation with which we were able to add ACEs as almost like a tactic, right? So we had this overarching goal of creating a trauma-informed culture. Then we had these specific objectives around how we were going to achieve that with screening. So when we rolled out the PHQ four years ago, much like Dr. Pavlovich was saying, we rolled out the PHQ, everyone thought that all of their patients were going to be screened and suddenly they were all going to be suicidal and there was going to be no one to respond in safety plan. Then we rolled out the GAD7 and the thought was that they were going to evoke anxiety um, and that there was going to be issues around dysregulation of patients. And so much in the same way that we've navigated those screenings and those integrations into our model. Um, we really go back to some of those lessons and say, you know, Dr. Jones, do you remember when we first rolled out PHQ and those concerns? So um, we've really, we've really kind of walked it backwards and done it in a very intentional manner. So interestingly enough, if you look at the five levels of our care model, it reflects like 
year one, uh, we were building up our social workers. Year two, suddenly we had to build up the psychiatry infrastructure. Then we realized there was a gap and we needed case management. So we brought in our nursing team to have that integrated and then our care, coordinated, care coordinators. So I, I say that because a lot of what this integration looked like and creating a cultural shift was over a long amount of time built on the relationships that I think everyone highlighted, really ensuring that the integration was meaningful, um, that we took appropriate pauses and really um, uh, reorganized along the way. Um, and, and, I, and I really wanna highlight that because it, it's pretty now, um, but it, it was messy in the beginning. And I, I think that that can be underscored is that I think Jessica highlighted the fact that we were already doing telepsychiatry, so we were able to pivot, but the agility came from the fact that we had these five levels of care and a comprehensive team. Um, and the one thing that I would encourage everyone listening to this call is just keep going, just keep taking those intentional steps. And before you know it, a day will be a week, a week will be a month, a month will be a year, and you actually have a collaborative care model. Um, I don't know if the team want to add to that because they shared many of those um, steps along the way. Yeah, I think just, you know, from a sus sustainability standpoint, I think it's really important. You have to have someone that's going to champion or be able to respond. And that may not be the immediate response. You know, they may still have to just follow through with like their CPS report or whatever that may look like. Um, but being able to circle back around to the staff, go back and discuss that case that really dysregulated them or, you know, looking at that part where they're at in that parallel process, because they're also learning, um, you know, a lot of the staff were learning about that. And so um, just being able to debrief the staff and make sure that there is some level of support for them, you know, emotionally. And again, going back to you, the, the clinical burnout and all of those pieces and just being mindful that this is not just a, a single screening or a single piece. This is really looking at our staff, our patients and our community from like a really holistic approach, so. Yeah, and going off of, um, you know, you mentioned clinical champions, we owe a lot of credit to Magdalena's work over the last seven years, um, paving the way of providing that trauma-informed approach. And I think what has been really helpful over the last year is leaning on uh, her leadership and then also learning um, the CRIM skills and actually having tangible strategies with a, within a trauma-informed um, ACEs-inspired lens so that uh, providers and staff have the confidence to um, reach out to those patients both one-on-one uh, -on -one and also just in ourselves, you know, as we go through our days and deal with our own dysregulation at times. And I want to add, I think also about how we made it meaningful is we wanted to relate to all the staff that it's not just a screen, it's not just five minutes and you get your score. It's also about treating and prevention. So looking ahead into the future generations, I think is part of the work that inspires mm. what, you know, is behind the, the screening. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Um, I think we'll do, this will be maybe our last question. Um, so patients have been, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're answering the question in the chat, Dr. Bablet. Um, Sorry. So um, where did it go? Oh my goodness, uh, this was a question, sorry. It was about sort of patient feedback and how, um, how, oh my goodness, sorry. I can Somebody. certainly read it, Jen, if you'd like. Um, we had um, someone ask if you guys have heard about concerns regarding bias um, and discrimination from patients in the community. Does that come up in anticipation of the screening? Um, and then, how have you um, dealt with that when it has come up? Um, so I'll just quickly, because I did put in the chat, really that issue has come up more from the provider side in the more labels we add to a patient's chart, you know, before we walk into the room, how might that affect how we think and comport ourselves, but stressing how universal ACEs are and the more work we do up front to check in with ourselves, our own experiences. Um, this has helped to dissipate that from the patient so far and other, uh, my MAs who I use as my advisory group for the most part, this has not been an active issue. And in fact, they're pretty excited that we're asking about it because they've heard, started hearing about it in some other forums. Does anyone else wanna comment on 
Sure. Um, bias and discrimination. Yeah, please go ahead. So we also uh, had all of our team complete an implicit bias training, um, which I think was really important to do that, that work to really reflect on, on where their skin might be a little thin and areas of opportunity for growth. Um, we also um, have done different layers of what we consider cultural humility training. Um, and then when there is a case that um, requires a, mand a mandated report or um, what we consider an escalation, those go on an escalation list. And then a team comes together after, I think Jessica really highlighted, not only do we do we like a debrief with the team to ensure that there is a comprehensive understanding and that everyone has um, a, a collective um, um, opportunity to bring their feelings forward on the case. Because when you think about it, an MA, a provider, multiple people work with the patient. But we also um, ensure that the chart itself is audited and that there is a really objective eye that reflects on what happened during the case. And there's always opportunities to do things better or how we could have addressed things in a different manner. So we try to do um, you know, those things after to ensure that people have the opportunity to, again, learn, um, not be in that moment and not be as charged and really reflect on opportunities within um, the response. Great, thank you so much. Um, any other questions or comments? We have like a couple more minutes. So if anybody wants to chime in, now's the time. Otherwise, um, Beverly Kyer, I'm gonna give you the last word here. Um, what would you like your provider partners to take away um, as a result of, of your work together on this project? But then to make the connection, uh, obviously the first thing is to understand what their learning basis under screening, what it informs, what it teaches us, what are the opportunities to help these children not become the adults that we need to rescue later. That's one of the things I want them to walk out understanding of what they need as well, for them to be mindful of the impacts on themselves so that they could maintain a level, level of effectiveness uh, for themselves. I want them also to be culturally sensitive, culturally hum uh, humble in their work with the uh, children. Um, and everybody plays a role. I know I'm repeating this, but there are people who will do screenings and people who won't. But I, I, I work with a lot of people who will probably not do the screenings, but they all are in a role where they could promote that they could encourage that they get to talk to the parents to help them be able to even do the screening forms and explain why it was important to do. As you said, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Wendy that um, they could remove the fear, you know, put in the volunteer, this is your opportunity to get to help your need for your family. They have that capacity to do that. So those are some of the things I like the mold well, but mostly making the connection of the ACEs for the children and the uh, adverse work experiences for themselves and for their colleagues to be accountability partners and team with everybody to do this extraordinary work. A great way to end it. Um, and I'll take a second and quote Dr. Burke Harris, um, because as we're talking about everyone hitting the pandemic wall, which I know I'm feeling and I'm sure many of us are, um, self-care is not selfish. That's Dr. Burke Harris's that she's been using with us when we're at the end of a long Friday or, or whatever the situation is. So um, do, do thank you all for your attention and participation today. And what a great discussion. Just I'm just thrilled and proud to be working with all of you. So thank you so much and have a great, great rest of your day. Nice to meet everybody.